holidays are rough on those who don't enjoy them. That there are some people that because of whatever circumstances that they've gone through or that they find themselves in, they don't like the seasons that we come into when it's family oriented or pressured by society to spend money or do things and whether we know it or not, there is a lot of peer pressure at the holidays. But at the same time, there's also opportunity. I know for myself, I've never enjoyed this time of year. I mean, I go out of my way to enjoy it and I'm able to participate in it in my own way, in the own way that I enjoy it. And so I found my balance in it. But normally, during this time of year, it was more of a family thing. And I just didn't didn't quite fit in because this season was just kind of my down season. So I just never really got into all the hoopla, you know, the excitement or whatever that people get for Thanksgiving and New Year's and Christmas. But I kind of enjoyed, you know, the music. I enjoyed the inspiration of it. But I didn't enjoy the perspiration that was associated with it. A lot of times there's a lot of angst and anxiety and kind of attitudes. So if you don't enjoy this time of year, don't worry about it. <laughs> as far as God's concerned, it's okay. Because every day is the day the Lord has made. But what you can do, you know, I know what it's like to be one of those people that you stood in line to get your turkey. You know, you went through and they handed you a turkey, you know, and then you went through the box and you picked up your little can of pumpkin paste. <laughs> you got your little box of stuffing, you know, and instant, you know, and you had maybe a canned vegetable or two and that was it. And you took it home and you told yourself that it was going to be a wonderful Thanksgiving. And when you got done, you tried to put it all together and eat it. You just didn't feel all that thankful. Because you wanted more. And you weren't content with what you had. And I've been there. I know what it's like. And I'm a boarding a Christian. I've been there where the only thing I had on a Thanksgiving day was a candle and a prayer. But you know... That candle and that prayer was one of the most intimate times and realizations of Jesus that I ever had in my life. Now, I've been to, you know, and I've always been invited to different people's homes for Thanksgiving. And I've gone to some at times, you know, my sisters, uh, my family at different occasions. You know, my wife this year is going to, you know, cook a turkey and, you know, we're going to eat it. <laughs> we're not going to set it up on some big table. You know, we're not that way. But... For me, the way I grew up, I had always been involved in serving, but not being served. So most of the time, when I sat down at a table, you know, formal table or whatever it may have been, I was always looking at the waiters and the people that were serving the people and the preparation that went into it as opposed to the actual eating it or participating in it. So my mindset was always weird because when Jesus said I came not to serve but to not to be served but to serve I kind of got blessed I went yeah so I always thought you know maybe if I don't want to participate in porking out and sitting around watching football maybe I could go serve other people and so I did that once you know and I, I worked in a gospel mission for a while and I've worked in food box ministry and did different things at different times you know that I enjoyed it it was fun Maybe that's something that you could do. You know, you could turn around your feelings at this time of year to help someone else. But I guess what I'm trying to say is be inspired. You know, take the time to enjoy. If you've gotten a free turkey, enjoy the free turkey. If you've gotten a, you know, expensive one and you paid, you know, a hundred bucks for it, God help you because you overpaid and you got ripped off. I don't care how healthy that turkey was. I don't care how natural it was. It ain't worth a hundred bucks. <laughs> Sorry, it isn't. No matter how you look at it. So much more people could be participating with you in. 
But boy, God bless you anyways, I think. But in whatever you're doing, whether it be celebrating Thanksgiving or football or, I don't know, <laughs> having a Friendsgiving, as I just recently heard, or maybe being sad because you don't have family. You don't have friends right now. You're going through a tough time. Seek, ask, and knock and the door will be open. Because this is a time of year that everyone will reach out in some way. Everyone will allow each other to participate in something about Thanksgiving. To enjoy it in some way. So don't be caught alone and desperate and in need. Rather, let yourself be ministered to if you need to be ministered to. Or minister to someone else if you need to. Or maybe because they need you to. But whatever you do, enjoy it as God has given it to you to do. Because God is the one who allowed all these circumstances to come together that maybe we aren't the Christian nation we think we are. Maybe we aren't the family that we pretend to be on certain holidays. You know, we don't. We don't look like the Norman Rockwell pictures anymore. You know, the family get-together isn't, you know, the the man and the woman and the children, but it's like the husband and the wife and the ex and the husband and the ex and the ex and the half and this and that and the other thing and whatever it may be and all of them kind of like not talking this one and talking that one or not going there and not doing this and not doing that. Who knows? I mean, it's the end of the world. That's obvious because the family situation is so deteriorating, <laughs> at least in a lot of our culture. And frankly... American culture has failed because this idea of freedom has brought about the realization that freedom isn't free. And it's not about somebody paying for freedom. No, it's about you have the opportunity to choose whom you will serve. Serve the Lord or serve yourself. Hey, you know, that's what it boils down to. And so our American culture of freedom is, is a fallacy. It always was. There's no such thing as freedom. You get to choose. That's all. You get to choose to go to heaven or go to hell. I mean, that's what freedom's about. But in Thanksgiving, we can thank God not for how bad things are or how good things are. We can thank God that we have another day to enjoy. That today or tomorrow, whichever day you're enjoying it and participating in it, you can eat, you can sleep, you can know that God has provided for you in some way. Because if you don't have, all you had to do was ask. Thou hast showed thy people hard things. I have always been glad that the psalmist said to God that some things were hard. There is no mistake about it, there are hard things in life. Some beautiful pink flowers were given me this summer, and as I took them I said, what are they? And the answer came, they are rock flowers. They grow and bloom only on rocks where you can see no soil. Then I thought of God's flowers growing in hard places. And I feel somehow that he may have a peculiar tenderness for his rock flowers that he may not have for his lilies and roses. God bless you if you are in a hard spot that you're trying to blossom without any soil, that you're trying to grow without any roots, that you're trying to be right where you're at with what you have, the person God intended you to be. Can I tell you something? Hagar was in the camp of Abraham. She wasn't conniving and some crooked servant that was evil, you know, and oh, Sarah was wonderful and always right. No. Hagar was just a servant, that's all. Pure and simple. She served Sarah. And so when Sarah, in her sinfulness, decided to give Hagar over to Abraham to bear a child, it wasn't an uncommon thing in those days. It wasn't something that was strange or weird, but it was part of the culture. And so Hagar, in seeking favor for her son was not doing anything that would have been out of the ordinary and in reality should have been accepted in the normal way of things because after all she was having the firstborn son but God chose 
not to honor the traditions of men. God can choose whom he chooses, and he can do as he decides to do. And we learn about that as it being works of the flesh and works of the spirit. But there's something interesting that people forget about Hagar. When Hagar was cast out by Abraham and sent out into the desert, really to die, because it didn't take her very far, the provision she was given, and she was baking underneath the sun, she called out to God in her despair. She said, don't let me see my son die, but rather let me die first. God spared her and her son. God will bless you where you're at in whatever circumstances you are, no matter how bad you think you are. You may have been in the counsel of the godly and now you feel like you've been cast out far away and you're not part of the Christian heritage. No, that's not true. Because God can reach out to you today and cause you to be thankful that he has already taken care of all of your sins. He's forgiven you for everything you've ever done and ever will do. And he's provided a way that you can bloom and be a blossom right where you're at. That you, even in your despair, could inspire someone. Just with a word, with a thought, with a care, with a deed, maybe with sharing a can of Spam. Because, you know, there was one Thanksgiving, I was thankful for that can of Spam. <laughs> I was thankful that I had no macaroni and cheese to go with it, but thank God I had that can of Spam. <laughs> the tests of life are to make, not break us. Trouble may demolish a man's business, but build up his character. The blow at the outward man may be the greatest blessing to the inner man. If God then puts or permits anything hard in your life, be sure that the real peril and the real trouble is what we shall lose if we flinch from it, rebel from it, or try to say that it's the devil instead of the Lord. I find in a lot of Christian circles today, people rejecting the hard things of God. The things where God says, deny yourself, that I'm going to take this away from you, that you aren't going to be healed, that yes, I do allow sometimes suffering in your life, and that I might not heal you from them. I might allow it for a purpose that you don't know, but I do. In all of those things, it's not the outward man that perishes that he's trying to save, but he's trying to change the inner person that can blossom in times of trial and tribulation that you might be going through, so that you would come through it with thanksgiving unto God, blessing him for the things that he's put you through. Because what may have seemed like such a hardship, and it was for the pilgrims in the early days when they were going through it and they were about to die, when suddenly they were delivered by the most unexpected sources. They were able to find a way and a means to harvest and to grow crop, to be provided for by peoples that they didn't reject, but accepted their wisdom of what God had taught them in his own way. And so in the communion of the two, strange bedfellows as they may have been, God might be teaching you something about maybe your thanksgiving and where you might get salvation from. You see, when I lived in Jerusalem, I found how hard and how cruel the Israeli can be. That when I had a problem with finding some ostomy supplies for myself, I couldn't get any help from the Jewish side. But when I went over to the Arab quarter, I was instantly taken care of. No questions asked, no thought. No problem. God can do the most unusual things with the right person at the right time. So don't be surprised if you're a Hagar or if you're a Sarah. What God really desires to do is to bring in your heart an attitude of gratitude and a place for him to live, abide, and take you from where you think you are 
to where he is. And you'll find that when you get to where he is, no matter what your outside circumstances are, oh, you'll be grateful.